Julia Gaudio. I am one of the four student organizers of the conference, along with Charlie Young, Ezra Tal, and Alreza Fala. Um, I would like to introduce Professor Eitan Modiano, the Associate Director of LIDS, who will give some opening remarks. So welcome again to the 24th um, LIDS Student Conference. I was wondering, is it the 23rd, the 24th, so it's the 24th, you settled that for me, thank you. Uh, so we have a wonderful uh, agenda for you for the next two days. A few words about uh, LIDS and our student conference. So, LIDS is uh, the oldest continuously operating lab uh, at MIT. Uh, it went by uh, various names over the years, and the present name, Laboratory of Information and Decision Systems, has been in existence for now over uh, 40 years. It's a relatively small lab by MIT standards with uh, about 30 uh, principal <coughs> investigators who are faculty and research staff. Uh, we have about 100 uh, graduate students and uh, a number of postdocs as well. Uh, the LIT Student Conference uh, started uh, a few years before I joined the faculty here in 1996 and has been ongoing uh, ever, uh, for every year at this time, the last week uh, of IAP, Thursday, Friday, ever since. Uh, it's completely uh, organized and run by our students. We just pay for it. They do everything else and we thank them for that. Um, it's a wonderful kind of marquee event of LIDS, the one I look forward to each and every year. We have a two-day program for you. I think we have a record number of uh, student presentations. Uh, I don't officially keep track of that. I just know it's a really large number of student presentations this year. Um, we have uh, four plenary talks. Uh, we will have one starting uh, in just a, a few minutes this morning. And we have four student sessions uh, one on optimizations and algorithms, another on networks later this afternoon. To, uh, tomorrow morning we'll have a machine learning and statistics session by the students, and tomorrow afternoon a control theory and its application session. Uh, we will have a poster session, uh, I believe that's today at lunch, right? Today at lunch we will have a poster session on the sixth floor, uh, which is where Leeds is located in the Leeds Lounge. We'll have the poster session, and we'll have the marquee banquet of this event. Uh, this year will be tonight on Thursday night. Uh, that's at 6 p.m. and that's at the what used to be called the Faculty Club. Now it's called the Semper uh, Conference Center. It's in Building E52 on the seventh floor. Um, the other very fun session that we're going to have is tomorrow afternoon, Friday afternoon at 4.45, we'll have a panel discussion uh, on the relevance of theoretical uh, research to real world problems and I really look forward to learning about that. Um, and then finally we will close with the reception again at the Leeds Lounge uh, at, uh, tomorrow afternoon after the last session. It will be a reception, we'll also have an opportunity to give awards to the best speakers and posters and so on. Uh, so please uh, welcome to all of that and try to attend as much as you can. Um, before we go on, I just want to I want to thank the organizers uh, of this event, our student organizers, Ali Reza, Julia, Ezra, and Charlie. Thank you for all the hard work. We'll have opportunity to thank you again tonight. I want to thank our plenary speakers uh, for joining us, traveling here for this uh, student conference. Uh, our panelists for tomorrow's session, Caroline Devavrat, Kalyan, and Nabe. And, uh, of course, the lead staff, and in particular, um, Francisco, who's back there, who done so much uh, to make this event happen, and Professor Peter Fald for his generous financial support of the event. So, I'm going to give it back to Juliana to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first honorary speaker is Professor Maria Fulina Balkan from Carnegie Mellon University. Her research is in machine learning, algorithms, and computational aspects of economics and game theory. Professor Balkan has won many awards, including the CNU SCS Distinguished Dissertation Award, an NSF Career Award, a Microsoft Faculty Research Fellowship, and a Sloan Research Fellowship. She was the program committee chair for CULT 2014 and ICMR 2016. 
and will be the general chair for ICML 2021. Today, she will be speaking on data-driven algorithm design. Please welcome Professor Beltham. All right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the nice introduction. So today, uh, I'll talk about uh, using machine learning uh, uh, for uh, algorithm design. And so, in particular, I'll be talking about some kind of uh, theoretical guarantees we've been developing in order to kind of help put this area, which I think is very exciting and important, of automated algorithm design or data algorithm design on, uh, I guess, uh, theoretical foundations. Okay, and the focus here is, I'm not sure if it's so much inspirative to this, but uh, either way I think it will be interesting. So the focus here will be more on uh, discrete optimization problems or uh, algorithms for combinatorial problems. And so this is really, wanted to think about this line of work is, uh, about using machine learning to influence theory of computing and algorithm design and many of the corresponding application areas. Okay. And let me start with the kind of the high level uh, overview of this line of work. So uh, the classic way uh, uh, to design and analyze algorithms for combinatorial problems assumes somehow that the algorithm that we design for uh, uh, our algorithm for our given algorithmic problem will be used to solve worst case instances of the underlying problem about which the algorithm has absolutely no information at all. Okay, and so the typical performance guarantees that we seek for in the classic uh, algori uh, algorithm framework, uh, 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 yeah, the typical performance guarantees in the classic algorithmic framework uh, basically uh, impose that the algorithm that we design for the given algorithmic problem must succeed even for solving just a one time worst case instance of the underlying algorithm problem. Okay, and within this classic framework, uh, uh, we, uh, there are some problems that are easy. And so for example, in the sense that for these problems we have uh, optimal polynomial time algorithms, that means we have algorithms that are polynomial time and are guaranteed to output the optimal solution even in worst case instances of the problem. Okay, and examples of problems of this type include problems uh, like sorting, shortest paths, or things that we teach in our undergraduate algorithms courses. And again, for these problems, we do have uh, optimal polynomial time algorithms that are guaranteed to do well on worst case instances. Okay, so there are some problems that are easy within the classic standard algorithmic framework. However, uh, there are also many problems for which we do not have such strong performance guarantees. Okay, and examples of problems of this type include clustering, problems, various partitioning problems over graphs, pricing problems, auction design problems. In fact, most problems are actually hard within the classic uh, analysis framework. Okay. Now, for such hard problems, uh, a typical approach commonly used in practice is to somehow to use data and machine learning to kind of automate the selection problem, the algorithm selection problem. Okay, so and this is particularly kind of, uh, this particularly makes sense in settings where we are trying to solve not only one instance of the underlying algorithmic problem, but we are repeatedly trying to solve instances of uh, the underlying algorithmic problem coming from some domain. Okay, and this makes sense, why? Because for such hard problems, you know, different methods seem to work, uh, in practice, work better in different settings, and there is often a large family of algorithms that we might try to use for the given algorithm problem. And so it makes a lot of sense to try to use the machine learning and instances of the problem coming from the domain in order to, uh, uh, right, in order to basically select an algorithm that is good just for type of instances. Okay, by the way, this is what I call data driven algorithm design. Now, uh, this approach makes sense and uh, in fact is widely used in practice. It has a long history in, in various communities. For example, in the artificial intelligence community, uh, in the computational biology community, in algorithmic mechanism design. So this, uh, this approach has been used in many different communities and several breakthroughs in these uh, domains have come from this approach. <laughs> okay, however, surprisingly, uh, until very recently, basically there has been no formal guarantees for this approach, no theoretical foundations uh, for the algorithm design. Okay, and what I'm gonna tell you about today is some recent line of work of ours uh, so, uh, on trying to provide strong formal guarantees for this approach, and I'll uh, discuss both several kind of case studies, several uh, algorithmic problems, and several algorithms, algorithm families for those problems that we analyze in our work. 
but also I'll discuss some general principles uh, that arise in these scenarios. And, uh, and from a theory point of view, this is something very interesting because it can help us push both the boundaries of algorithm design and theory of computing, but also uh, it's actually the underlying techniques are also of high interest to learn theory. Okay, so that's kind of the high level of your line of work. And uh, for those of you who uh, happen to be machine learning people in the audience, I want to mention that this is actually very related to uh, some very hot or popular topics in machine learning these days, like hyperparameter tunings, uh, auto ML and metal elements. So it's only used for kind of similar things. And this line of work of data driven algorithm design is very, uh, kind of related to those, except that it's really in the context of more combinatorial problems and also with formal them. Okay. So in this introduction of the, uh, the structure of my talk is as follows. I'll first, uh, 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 so in the first part of the talk, I'll, sh I'll uh, introduce kind of a batch learning or distribution learning formalization for data and design. And here I'll describe a general framework and more general principles to think about these problems and also uh, talk about some key studies like clustering problems, partitioning problems, and uh, potentially auction problems. Um, and uh, then in the second part of the talk, I'll also talk about how we can think about uh, data driven algorithm design as an online learning problem and how we have to generalize, completely generalize the framework of online learning to uh, think about these scenarios. Okay. Uh, but, and so I'll start with the first part of uh, the talk where uh, we'll be talking about kind of a distribution learning formulation for the algorithm, data driven algorithm selection problem. But before doing so, just to be concrete, uh, I want to mention one example of a hard combinatorial problem we might want to solve by using this data driven approach. Okay, this is clustering. It's a kind of a well-known problem. It comes up in many different applications. So intuitively, the goal is we are given a set of objects, like news articles or web pages or search results by topic, and then the goal is to somehow organize them internationally. Okay, and note that uh, we, uh, in certain cases, we uh, actually we often need to solve uh, re uh, such clustering problems repeatedly. So we need to solve not only one instance of the clustering problem, but repeatedly to solve instances of the underlying clustering problem. So for example, if the goal is to cluster news articles by topic, which is what Google News does, then of course we'll be clustering uh, news articles uh, every day, many times a day, right? So we repeatedly solve instances of the underlying problem. Okay. Now, uh, to be a bit more concrete, uh, like a, a classic approach to solve clustering problems is to do objective-based clustering or we pick a specific objective function and we're trying to optimize it. Okay, so for example, uh, a classic objective here is, so the k is objective, so the, uh, we are given a set S of an object, say, and then in this case the goal is to uh, find the partition uh, of the points and centers for each part of the partition in order to minimize the sum of all points of the distance squared to the nearest center, right? Distance squared to the center of the partition. Of the, of the, okay? So this is k-means, a uh, related objective, a related objective is k-median, where the goal is now to find, uh, again, a partition and centers for each uh, part of the partition in order to minimize the, dis the sum of all points of the distance to the corresponding center, to the closest center. Okay, and yet another version, uh, another objective here is a uh, case center uh, objective for the facility location uh, uh, problem where now the goal is to find a partition in, in order to minimize and centers in order to minimize uh, the, uh, the maximum distance to the real center. Okay, now all these objectives are MP hard and so uh, that means there is no hope to have a universal efficient algorithm that works on, on worst case instances. So this is a perfect application of this data driven approach, right? Because it's hard in the classic framework. Okay, now with this example in mind, now I can go and describe how we can think about kind of uh, algorithm selection as a distributional <coughs> learning problem. Okay, and uh, again, if you are doing machine learning, this will be very natural, natural formalization to you. Uh, so here's the formalization. So what we do, we fix the problem that we want to solve, say clustering or facility location. Okay, and then we fix a large uh, family of algorithms, potentially infinite, potentially parameterized family of algorithms for our problem. 
And you know, we might fix this some of the other things because it might uh, it often happens for open interactive, so because we have an IP that it should be that is a good thing. Okay. And then what we do, we take typical instances uh, for our problem coming from our specific domain. Again, okay, formally we assume that these instances are drawn IIB, so they are random instances drawn IIB from some fixed and known distribution of our uh, instances of the underlying problem. Okay? And so we take these typical instances and then we use these typical instances of our ca coming from our known distribution of our typical instances in order to find an algorithm from our family of algorithms that we hope that that's one of new instances that come from the same uh, underlying source. Okay? So that's the goal, and let me say it again. So we fix the problem that we want to solve, say clustering or a facility location problem, and then we fix a large uh, family of algorithms for our problem. And you know, these algorithms can contain classic modules of the type that we are used with. Like they can, these algorithms can contain like greedy components and dynamic programming components and so on, right? And moreover, uh, this family could also be infinite because many of these modules could have some parameters or tunes or knobs that you might have to tune. Right? So this could be infinite uh, parameterized family of algorithms. Okay, so we fix our problem. We fix a large infinite potentially parameterized family of algorithms. And then what we do, we take a sample of typical instances coming from our underlying domain or from our underlying distribution for the problem that we want to solve. Okay, so for example, if we are trying to do, say, uh, facility location, we might take an input, as, uh, we take a sample of instances coming from our domain, which in this case will be maybe an input graph one, input graph two, and so on, input graph capital R. Right? This, this is if we do facility location, if we do clustering, say so documents by topic, again, we take a sample of uh, instances coming from our un underlying distribution of our possible instances. And so, for example, this will be, a, say, a first set of documents, if we do clustering of documents by topic, a second set of documents, and so on. Right? So these are samples, our training instances. Okay, and then the goal is to use this sample of typical instances in order to come up with an algorithm from this family of algorithms, but again, we hope that that's one of new instances. Uh, coming from the same underlying source. Okay, so that's pretty much like a really distributional machine learning formalization for the algorithm selection problem. And uh, because it's, uh, and then um, it's kind of a natural approach in these distributional machine learning formalizations is to try to do a, what they call empirical synchronization. Right? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna to solve our problem, our original problem, what we're gonna do, we're gonna try to find an algorithm, I'll call it a head that is nearly optimal over the training set of typical instances. Okay. Now, uh, this makes sense, but of course, the key question here is a generalizability question. Right? So will this algorithm I have it as well over the sample of typical instances do well on new instances that we've never seen in the training set? And in particular, will, will it do as well as the best algorithm from this family, or nearly as well as the best algorithm from this family of algorithms with respect to, so what I mean by best, the, the best thing with respect to random instances coming from uh, the underlying unknown distribution. Okay? So, so that's a key question, whether uh, this algorithm may have it as well over the typical instances will do well on new instances that we've not seen in the training set. And compete with the best algorithm from this family of algorithms with respect to unknown, uh, with respect to instances coming at random from the unknown distribution. Okay, so for example, for the clustering problem, if I try to do a clustering problem, of course this algorithm I have that is nearly optimal over the set of typical instances will do well on the trained set of typical instances because we've chosen to do so. But the key question is, will it do well on new instances that we've not seen in the training set? Yeah. Well, what is the difference between this and uh, the online learning? Uh, it's, it's just statistics. It's so I'll address it in a second. Okay, so like first of all, I want to discuss the problem. It is, okay, so actually let me mention it right now, and that's how we, it, it's very different because it's coming out of the problems and I describe it in detail. The chorus of the functions we get, I'll show this completely. So, oh, it's a specific loss, you see, and the parameters. Yeah, it's a specific loss, so at the high level, as you see, uh, it will be just an application, at the very, very high level, it's just an application of classic machine learning. Which I'm just saying, I'm just only the problem how the selection of statistical uh, learning theory problem. But the question is, now you have to talk about how many samples do I need to achieve generalization and to realize sample complexity, and now we will get into a structure that is very different from classic machine. 
Okay, that's a piece of that, that point of my talk. You'll see many examples. So, I mean, so yeah, it's exciting also from a machine learning and a machine learning point of view. Yeah, no, I'm not the... Yes. I'm just pointing out. Also, I think the main use here is to really change the way people do algorithm design, you know, and to change the way you think about algorithm analysis and design. Okay, but it's also definitely interesting from a machine learning point of view as well. But by the way, thank you for the question, and please feel free to ask any questions. So, I'm happy to take any questions online. Okay. Cool, so going back to my story, so right, so maybe this is a too, too, too slow story for me if you're very familiar with statistical theory, but because it's the broader audience, I'm trying to make sure that we're on the same page, right? So, uh, uh, right, so we're trying to, we're formulating uh, kind of the algorithm selection as a uh, machine learning problem, right? Well, we fix the problem that we want to solve, then we fix a large family of algorithms for our problem, we take samples of random coming, uh, we take a, a train set of uh, samples coming that random from an unknown distribution of a, uh, possible uh, instances, and we use this training set of uh, examples to come up with an algorithm that we hope does well on our new set of uh, examples. Right, and the approach here would be we're going to do empirical risk minimization, or find an algorithm that a head that does well on the training set of typical instances. But of course, the key question is, Will this generalize? Will this do? Will this algorithm I had do well on new instances that we've not seen in the training set, and in particular on uh, on not fraction of those instances? Will it do any good? Okay. And so this is really a sample complexity question, as Andreas mentioning. It's just a classic sample complexity question, statistical learning theory. But of course, the answer will depend on how many instances we see in the training set. Uh, and so now the key question here is. Like if we see more instances, or see very few instances, then we hope to generalize, but if we see more and more instances, we generalize better and better. Right? So the key question here, here is, how large should our sample of typical instances be in order to guarantee that good performance of the training set of typical instances translates to good performance in new instances as well? Right? That's what we call a sample complexity question in machine learning. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the key idea here is to use, tools, to use the statistical learning theory framework, right? To use tools from learning theory and empirical processes in order to understand this question. And in, the one approach that we've used so far in our work is to use so-called uniform convergence uh, uh, bounds for addressing the sample complexity question. And what are these uniform convergence <coughs> bounds? They are bounds on the number of samples we need to see in the training set, so that with high probability over the draw of the training set of typical instances, we are guaranteed that uniformly for all the algorithms in our large, potentially infinite family of algorithms, the average performance of the training set of typical instances is close, say, additively epsilon close, to the uh, uh, average performance over the underlying unknown distribution. Okay, so this is a uniform convergence bound that, and also they are very nice because if we have enough samples for this uniform convergence, this immediately implies that the algorithm may pet, but is nearly optimal over the training set of typical instances, will also have good performance uh, overall. In particular, will do nearly as well as the best algorithm in the family with respect to the unknown distribution. Okay? And as Andrea was saying, thank you for pointing that out. So basically, you know, like we have tools from learning theory to understand how many samples do we need to achieve uniform convergence. Right, so it's the whole field that just analyzes itself. And at the high level, you know, what we know from this uh, learning theory, uh, statistical learning theory framework, is that in order to understand the sample <coughs> complexity question uh, that we've been talking about, all you need to understand is how, how, how intrinsically complex is a family of arguments that we are looking at. What kind of the intrinsic complexity or the intrinsic dimension of the family of arguments that we are looking at. Okay, now there are. Uh, and so, uh, so in particular, there are bounds. Uh, there, are, there are bounds that we can put down uniform convergence bounds as a function of how intrinsically complex this family of algorithms is. Okay, so there are bounds of this form. You know, let's say, uh, well, if the number of samples you see in the training set is a function of how intrinsically complex the family of algorithms is, or perhaps, uh, then that's sufficient to achieve uniform convergence and so generalize. Okay, and I'm not going to formally, super formally define what these uh, notional dimensions are that appear in the bounds. I'm just going to give it a high level intuition. Uh, so there are these notions of dimensions from learning theory, like VC dimension or other macro complexity or pseudo dimension. Uh, so these are notions of dimensions for classical <coughs> functions, in our case, 
this will be classes of algorithms. But our, what we are trying to do, we are just trying to kind of measure, intuitively speaking, the ability of this function class to feed uh, complex patterns. Right? The more complex patterns they are able to feed, the more sample we need for generalization. Okay? And uh, in particular, like you might wonder, why do I care about uh, being able to feed complex patterns from a generalization point of view? Well, because if my class of functions, or in this case my class of algorithms is so complex, so that uh, basically I'm able to find two functions in my class, but on the training set of typical instances behave about the same, but they are very different everywhere else, then of course I'm not going to be able to achieve generalization. Right? And there are various notions that I mentioned, like the one that I'm going to use today is called pseudo-dimension, but are exactly trying to, uh, to, to kind of capture how many samples are sufficient so that kind of this bad behavior doesn't happen. So that you don't over. Yes? What does typical here mean? Typical instances, what does that mean? Yeah, so as I said, uh, we assumed that, I said, I said it informally because I don't want to do sort of notation, but we are assuming that there is a distribution of instances of the problem we are trying to solve. So for example, if you have a clustering problem, there's a distribution of a clustering problems you might be given to solve. And we are assuming that in the training set, the, the, the training instances are drawn at random from the distribution of typical instances. Right? So if I go back here, like to this picture, so for example, if I'm trying to solve clustering problems, I'm assuming that it's a distribution of an instances that I might be given to solve, and in the training phase, all the training examples are drawn at random from a distribution, like this set of documents or, uh, draw at random from a distribution, this other set of documents draw at random from a distribution, and so on. And then so this time I'm assuming that training samples are drawn random from the distribution. And I'm also going to assume that the test examples are drawn from the distribution as well. So if the distribution is, say, heavy tail, are those heavy tails represented in that typical sample? We just draw samples at random from the distribution in the training phase. And then the question is how many samples do you need to draw from the distribution to make sure that if you optimize on the training set for the typical instances, you also do well with high probability or with only instances coming at the end of the same distribution. So the distribution is arbitrary, is arbitrary in general. It's not so. It's not. There is a. Uh, is can, it's an arbitrary distribution. Fixed time on. No specific. No specific properties. This is a statistical level formalization. That's actually the power of statistical level theory. Don't make any assumption about the distribution, about properties of distribution. But somehow still magically we're able to get generalization there. So that's the power of statistical level theory. So if you get data in capital letters, you can well, yeah. So you get samples later on in the, the, the training and the test will be drawn from the individual Yeah, but it's a heavy tail, so you never know that's a very low probability, I think that's what Davish is saying. So there is no guarantee for that heavy tail. Yes, the guarantee will be like what will, will be like you know absolute that out like the guarantee right. that you, right. you have yeah. There are no more questions, so I would also address Andrea's earlier question. So, like, his question was, well, we can phrase the statistical learning theory problem, but what's new compared to classic machine learning? Well, and it turns out that actually, um, uh, so there are many, uh, like, it turns out that basically, uh, because the class of functions we are looking at is much more complex, you know, we have algorithms that have combinatorial and modular nature, so each function in the class is an algorithm. They have combinatorial and modular nature. They have modules and they are combinatorial. And uh, because of that, uh, it turns out that you know uh, we can get into a situation where nearby kind of algorithms, if, for example, if we slightly tweak the parameters of the algorithm, we can uh, that can lead to totally different outputs or many different inputs. Right? So basically, uh, because of the combinatorial nature, we can uh, be in a situation where close by problem can have drastically different behavior. So it's less stable than class, I mean, the some sort of instability that could occur, and this is a very rare class in machine learning. Okay, so basically, because of that, we kind of really have to totally, uh, to analyze this notion of dimension, we have to present a class of totally compared to class in machine learning. 
So really the, the main difference compared to classic machine learning is understanding this notion of dimension. Okay. And uh, that's one challenge. And another challenge is uh, we also, of course, not only want to understand the sample complexity question, like how many samples do you organization, but we also want the meta algorithm, the algorithm the meta selects that even out the dozen and all instances to be computational efficient. Okay, and um, um, cool. So uh, this framework, just to mention, this framework was introduced to the idea of using uh, learning. Uh, distributional learning as a uh, formalization for algorithm selection was introduced in a, a paper, in a, re in, a recent line, uh, in, a, in a recent paper by Tim Ravgard and Rishi Gupta, and they proposed the idea of using learning theory, statistical learning theory for algorithm selection, and they also analyzed uh, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, subset selection problems like NAPSEC and independent set, they basically provided bounds and the pseudo dimension of the corresponding uh, family of algorithms. Now, uh, since then, uh, we basically uh, kind of significantly expanded this line of work and so analyzed many uh, new algorithm, algorithm classes that are applicable for wearing the problems, as you see, uh, including clustering problems, partitioning problems, options, uh, and so on. And not only we analyzed specific algorithm classes, but I think we also identified interesting general techniques for trying to understand the sample complexity uh, of uh, such algorithm classes based on properties of the dual class of functions. And, um, right, and so just to, so this, uh, so this is a high level overview of the results, just to mention, just to give a few examples of classes of uh, problems and classes of algorithms that we analyze in our work, I'm just gonna list them and then I'm going to give details about some, uh, uh, a few of them. Okay, so uh, one, uh, in, the, in our first work in this line of work, we analyzed, we looked at clustering problems, and here we looked at uh, uh, infinite parameterized family of clustering algorithms that first link the data into a hierarchy, uh, uh, and then do dynamic programming to extract the best kind of pruning of the hierarchy. Okay, so that's one family uh, from uh, clustering problems. Uh, clustering algorithms we looked at in a, a recent new RIPS paper. We also looked at uh, another uh, very widely used family of clustering methods. These are parameterized Lloyd's methods, where we first somehow uh, greedily pick some uh, starting uh, centers, and then we do local search to improve the corresponding uh, clustering. Okay, uh, this is for clustering problems. We also looked at uh, partitioning problems that can be written as integer quadratic programs, <coughs> MASCAT. And here we looked at uh, uh, infinite parameterized family of algorithms where we first do uh, semi-definite programming relaxation and then we do randomized rounding. And this again can be parameterized. Okay, and in a related line of work, we also looked at uh, similar questions in the context of pricing problems and mechanism design for multi-buyer, multi-unit items, uh, multi-buyer, multi-item uh, scenario, multi-unit item scenarios. Uh, and in all of these problems that I mentioned so far, um, so uh, we scored the algorithm, so the performance, because I was a little bit vague but in the way I talked about so far, but what do you, how do we score our algorithms, the performance of our algorithms, in all of these problems that I mentioned so far, we score them according to solution quality. So for example, if I do a clustering problem, we score an algorithm according to how good the clustering produced is. Okay. But we also have uh, some other line of work where we looked at, uh, we're trying to apply the same ideas in the context of branch and bound. We're trying to look at how to branch. And there, the score or the quality of an algorithm is defined as the running time of the algorithms. Okay, so these are solutions with branch and bound techniques, are solutions, are, are algorithms are solving uh, mixed integer programs, and we solve, each algorithm in the family solves the problem to optimality, but what we are trying to, the, how we score an algorithm is according to the running time, so that we are trying to minimize. Okay, so this is kind of an overview of, uh, of uh, the types of problems we looked at. And uh, in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to give you um, some uh, uh, details about the clustering problems via linkage to the programming and the integrality problems. And then at the end, I'll talk about an online learning formulation of all this approach. Okay. So. Yes, I will move on and uh, talk about clustering problems. Uh, and again, we've seen this already. Uh, 
So in the clustering uh, case, we are given in the, uh, for clustering. Uh, 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 so here we are given a set, as input a set of objects, and we are trying to uh, organize it into natural groups. So for example, we might be using the K-means objective as uh, an algorithmic approach. Where here the goal is, we are given as input a set S of an object, and the goal is to uh, uh, output the partition uh, and center of the partition in order to minimize the sum over a point of the distance square in the near set. Okay, and uh, K means like many other clustering objectives is every part, and so this is a, a, a great, uh, it's a perfect example of a good application for the data given approach. Okay, and in order to take this data given approach for the uh, algorithm selection, say for these clustering problems, the very first thing we have to specify is a family of algorithms we're going to optimize over. Okay, and so uh, one family that we looked at with, uh, is the following. Uh, so it has two stages, so it's an algorithm that have two stages. In the first stage, we're going to use uh, a greedy linkage based algorithm in order to organize the data into a hierarchy or into a tree of clusters. Uh, and then we're going to use dynamic programming to extract uh, the best uh, pruning uh, from this uh, hierarchy. Okay, so uh, we first, uh, and, and actually notice that this, uh, both of these steps, both the linkage step and the dynamic programming step can be done efficiently in one number of time. This is why these are widely used uh, algorithms in practice. Okay, and uh, again, the family of algorithms that we are looking at right now is, can now be described, can be described nicely pictorially. So we first are going to do a linkage-based procedure to organize the data into a hierarchy, and then we're going to do that a dynamic programming to extract the best unit from the hierarchy. Okay, and even if we fix the objective function, say we're trying to learn an algorithm to solve the k-means clustering problem, if, even if we fix the objective function, so the second step here is fixed, even then we have many possible options about how, about how we might be doing the linkage step. Right, and so for example, uh, we could be using single linkage, or could be using concrete linkage, or could be using garbage linkage. Right, so we have many possible options, and so that's why we uh, immediately get an infinite uh, parameterized uh, potentially family <coughs> values for this uh, clustering problem that do first linkage followed by the many programming. Okay, and just to remind you, in case you've never seen, uh, like what are these linkage procedures? Are very simple bottom-up uh, procedures where we start with each point in its own little, uh, or each point in its own little cluster, and then we repeatedly merge the two closest clusters until we get uh, uh, all the data, set of points in one big cluster at the top. Now, uh, of course, different definition of closest, right, I said to repeatedly merge uh, the closest two clusters, but of course different definitions of closest leads to different algorithms. Okay, and so, for example, uh, I'm going to list three uh, uh, classic ones, traditional ones that we teach in another machine learning. So, for example, in the single linkage algorithm, we define the distance between two sets A and B uh, to be the minimum distance between uh, points in the two corresponding sets. In, uh, one classic algorithm, linkage algorithm, in complete linkage. For complete linkage uh, algorithms, we define the distance between two sets to be the maximum distance between uh, points in the two corresponding sets. In average linkage, now we define the distance to be just the average distance between points in the two, co uh, in the two corresponding sets. Okay? And so these are classic objectives, but of course we, uh, uh, we can even get uh, uh, basically an infinite family of uh, linkage procedures. Why? Because we can now start, you can, put, uh, you can start weighing these classic objectives differently. Right, you can get the whole spectrum incorporating between uh, classic algorithms. Okay, so for example, one family of uh, such uh, parameterized linkage procedures that we analyze in our work is an interpolation, a linear interpolation between single linkage and complete linkage. Okay, so what that means is that there exists some unknown parameter alpha, uh, uh, and, we, uh, and, uh, and then we define the distance between two sets A and B to be alpha times the distance given by the single linkage plus one and some other kind of given by the linkage. Yes? So that means at every layer you're choosing a matching, and uh, when you say greedy, you're choosing the matching in a greedy manner. Uh, it's not a matching, at every layer. Because you're, you're sort of doing uh, I'm just speaking the two closest. I'm just, I'm getting a minor key. Yeah, so like if I think of uh, nodes at the bottom layer, yeah. there's nodes in the graph, and it is weighted as per 
your weight function. Yeah. And you're sort of actually making the matching, right? I'm actually doing uh, between the nodes of the, the nodes at that layer. Right? Like you match the soccer and tennis here, and Gucci and Lacoste here, right? Now this is the next round. So think about them as being, if I start at every point, think of about being going into F, uh, so minus sure. one steps, and in the first step I'm going to I'm making the closest. And sure. then I have another round, the next closest, and so on. So you're starting to match just two. I just took two is time, exactly. Yeah, and then so you're matching the nodes at the bottom layer between each other, right? Maybe so. It's a yeah. I guess the matching. I'm just uh, uh, yeah. Maybe it's a detail. But I'm only taking about so, two clauses. So there's just trying to understand so where the greedy part comes in. Greedy part comes in in terms of first use of just because at every moment in time and just leave the, the two clauses uh, at any given level. But you can match sets of different size. So there is a guy who she remains by itself, and the other exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but so I generally speak, you have clusters at any moment in time, the different sizes around, and they just pick the two clauses clusters to. To link together, to, to, to merge together. I see, so we do it in sort of atomic way. Exactly. Yes, it's not quite natural. Right? And so, um, and, uh, again, like the key question here is like, what, what uh, distance, uh, like, uh, how, according to what criteria should I match? Or, I'm sorry, should I, uh, should I choose which two clusters to, to merge at the moment in time, at the moment in time? And there are classic ones. Given by single linkage, the play linkage and double linkage, but you can also imagine interpolating between these classic ones, uh, where you can put more weight on one classic, more weight on one classic criterion versus another, right? And you are trying to learn to see which of them is best for the data. Okay, and uh, basically now we basically get uh, again like this picture, where we now have uh, because we have many choices about how to do the linkage step. We uh, get basically an infinite parameterized and your class and procedure that we do linkage followed by a linkage problem. And uh, uh, I want just to mention before telling you results, uh, uh, formal results for this family of, uh, for this approach, I want to mention that actually these techniques are really widely used in practice, like in computational biology, my friends in computational biology, I use them all the time. So that's a kind of a practical motivation to look at such family of clustering algorithms. But also I want to mention they also have some strong properties from a theory of computing point of view. So for example, if the data is stable, in the sense that slightly, per, slightly pertained with the input distance doesn't modify the optimal solution very much, then it turns out that there are algorithms from this, family, uh, algorithms of this form that give the best known values. Okay? So they have both theoretical and kind of practical justification. Okay, now from a data-driven algorithm design point of view, so uh, what we are able to show for such uh, kind of uh, families of clustering algorithms, so what we are able to show, we are able to give kind of sample complexity bounds, that means bounds on how many samples we need to see in the training set, so that we are guaranteed that we kind of output an algorithm that does well on new uh, instances coming from the same underlying distribution. And the sample complexity bounds, as we discussed, depend on the pseudo dimension uh, the, or the interesting complexity of these family of uh, algorithms. And so, for, for example, for this alpha weighted linkage uh, family of algorithms, where what we do, we interpolate linearly in the linkage step, we interpolate linearly between single linkage and complete linkage. Um, so it's just parameters by one uh, parameter. Uh, we can show that the pseudo dimension of the interesting, or, or that uh, we can show that the interesting complexity of this family of algorithms is logarithmic in N, where N is an upper bound on the uh, maximum number of points my type of cluster in any given instance. Okay, so it's small enough, but it's not a constant, right? Because for example, in classic machine learning, you say if it's a one parameter, but it's a familiar function, from that one parameter, typically the corresponding dimension is one. It's not one in this case. It's not a constant. It's log n, so it's still small, but not a constant. And it turns out because the interesting dimension is only log n here, we can also show that we have a meta, uh, the, the corresponding meta procedure for selecting the best clustering algorithm from the class will also be computational. Okay. And again, the key technical challenge, oops, uh, is like in order to, to get these results, why they're not an immediate application of standard statistical learning theory, the key technical challenge here is that because of the very combinatorial nature of this kind of functions, uh, function class, we can be in a situation where a single change, uh, like a slight change in the parameters, can lead to totally different outputs. 
Right? So for example, for this kind of linkage-based procedure, a single change, like if I slightly change the parameter, that leads to a slight change early on made by the linkage procedure that can kind of uh, snowball and produce much, much bigger changes later on. So slight changes in the underlying parameters can lead to totally different outputs. Okay, so that's the feature that we really have to uh, overcome here. Um, but, um, cool. And, um, uh, and I'm, that turns out we can overcome that key challenge. And I'm just want to give you a bit of intuition of, uh, for this, uh, how we do that for this simple uh, family of uh, uh, linkage-based procedures or interoperative linear between single linkage and complete linkage. And so we are able to show that uh, the absolute dimension, as I mentioned, we are able to show that the absolute dimension is only log n, and so we get small sample complexity. Okay, and in order to prove this, uh, the key fact for proving this is uh, the following fact, which is really a kind of a, uh, like a, structure property on the class of dual functions. And uh, this turns out to be the main theme throughout this line of work. So we are able to uh, provide bounds, pseudo-dimension bounds on the original class of functions by using structure properties of dual function. Okay, so what is the structure property on the dual function for this uh, uh, family of algorithms? Uh, well, uh, we're interpolate between linkage, single linkage and complete linkage. So the structure property is as follows. So if we fix a clustering instance, of say n points, and then we imagine varying alpha, the parameter that goes from zero to one, imagine varying the parameter, turns out that there are at most n to the eight switching points uh, where the behavior of that instance changes. Right? So for any given value of the parameter alpha, that determines how the linkage procedure works, so any given value of the parameter, you know, uh, will, uh, the algorithm are going to operate in a certain way, we're going to link clusters in a certain order, and so the end we're going to get a certain tree. Now, of course, two different values of alpha, alpha 1 and alpha 2, say, might lead to different trees, right? But what we show here is that as we fi if we fix the instance and we vary the parameter alpha from 0 to 1, there are most n to the 8 critical moments, critical values of alpha, where the behavior, the class, the, 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 the class tree produced changes. The tree produced changes, basically. And because then in the second step, we only do kind of dynamic programming, to extract the best clustering uh, from this tree, that means that the final cost function is just a piecewise constant function with almost n to the eight pieces. Okay, so we can have sharp discontinuities, but we bound how many of those happen. Okay, and in this specific case, it's actually even, uh, I can even give the very high, the kind of the key insight of why that's the case. In general, it's of course more, more challenging to analyze, but here it's not too challenging. So the key idea here is, so if we fix the value of alpha, and we are thinking about how the linkage algorithm operates. Uh, so let's think that we are some moment in the, uh, to the, in the, at some moment in the execution of the algorithm, and we have a choice. We are trying to think, should we merge n1 and then two blobs, n1 and then two next, or should we merge blobs n3 and then four next? That's a choice that we have to make, because we only merge just two of them at any moment in time. Okay, and now the answer to this question will depend on, uh, basically, uh, will depend on uh, for quantities, right? So we, let's think about P and cube is a fa uh, as being the farthest points in n and the two first two blobs and n one and n two. And let's think about P prime and Q prime to be the, uh, as being the closest points uh, in the two corresponding blobs and n one and n two. And similar, let's think about R and S as being the farthest points in the blobs n three and n four, and uh, L prime and S prime being the closest uh, points in the two blobs n three and n four. Now, the decision of which of these two blobs will I merge, n1, n2 versus n3, and n4, will depend on which of these two quantities is smaller. It right? depends on whether 1 minus alpha times the distance between p and q plus alpha times the distance between p prime and q prime. So whether this quantity is smaller or bigger compared to this other quantity here. 1 minus alpha times the distance between r and s plus alpha times the distance between r prime and s prime. Okay? And because of this, if you think about it, that means that an interval boundary where the behaviors, I very alpha, the behavior of the algorithm changes, must be an equality for uh, a linear equation like this given by a set of eight points. Okay, but because I have only n points in total, that means I can only have n to the eight interval boundaries. Okay, and so this is for one clustering instance. If I fix one clustering instance in I very alpha, I can show that there are n to the eight critical points where the behavior of the algorithm changes as I very alpha. Now, in general, I'm trying to analyze the notion of dimension. Of course, I care the behavior of my function class over many clustering instances, not only one clustering instance. 
But using the fact on the previous slide, I can show that if I have n clustering instances uh, of at most n points, as I vary alpha, I only get kind of like at most n times n to the eight patterns, okay, binary patterns. And for those of you familiar with what the two-dimension is, in order to compute the two-dimension, what I need to do is to find the largest m, the largest number of instances for which I get an exponential number of patterns. I get, say, two to the n patterns, okay? Uh, this is what the two-dimension is. And so uh, this is the definition of two-dimension. I know that for, for, for my problem structure, if I uh, have m clustering instances of at most n points, I can go on m at most n, to, n times n to the eight patterns. And so that means I can compute the two-dimension by solving for the largest m, the largest number of instances, uh, for which I can get an exponential number of patterns. So I have to do just solve this inequality. So for the m, such that the number of instances is m, such that 2 to the m is accompanied by m times n to the 8. So and if you solve this inequality, you get that uh, m is accompanied by log n, right? Okay, so that's basically a proof of why the pseudo dimension for this uh, class of algorithms is only log n. Okay, and now, uh, and so which, what that implies, that implies that, uh, and now, now plug into tools from statistical learning theory, that implies that uh, 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 if the subdivision is log n, that means that if in the training phase I, only, I see log n over epsilon squared, roughly, that is sufficient so that with high probability with that, that uniformly over all algorithms in our algorithm class, we have their uh, their average behavior of the sample is epsilon plus the average behavior overall, and so that means that if I optimize over the sample, I get general Okay, and uh, because the pseudo dimension here is only log n, turns out that you can also find, uh, if you are given a sample S of typical instances for our underlying algorithm problem, then we can also find the best algorithm from this family of algorithms in for normal time. Uh, and in particular, all you have to do is, given the sample of typical instances, all you have to do is to kind of solve for this critical point over, for, uh, over our sample of typical instances. And then just take the best of this interface. Okay, and that will be, well, this will also uh, implement essentially RN for this uh, function class of algorithms. Okay, and uh, I want to, uh, to also give you, a, before moving on, I also want to give you a high learning theory, a level learning theory bit here. Why this is, I think, very exciting from a learning theory point of view is because we are trying to kind of come up with a generalizability guarantee and to come up with an upper bound on the pseudo dimension of the, uh, of the original class of functions. In this case, these are class of functions parameterized by the parameter alpha and they can see input instances of our underlying algorithm problems. Okay, so that's our goal to, uh, to prove, say, uniform convergence for functions of this form that are parameterized by alpha and they can input instances of the underlying algorithm problem. But in order to come up with an upper bound on the pseudo dimension of this uh, function class, what we end up taking advantage of, so our proof takes advantage of the structure of the dual class of functions, and our function in the dual class is parameterized by an instance of the underlying algorithm problem and takes as inputs possible values of the parameters. And what we took advantage of is that the dual functions are piecewise constants, so they are nice. Okay, and this is a thing that comes from all this line of work. We show that these dual functions are sufficiently structured, which then uh, allows us to get to an Okay, so this happened in this problem, it happens in other problem scenarios. So for example, another family of algorithms that we analyzed that I mentioned earlier in the talk, is one where we are trying to um, solve integer quadratic program, uh, uh, problems by using SD relaxations plus rounding. Uh, so here the, the goal is maybe to, so we, let's think about the problem that can be written as an integer quadratic program. So I'm trying to optimize this quadratic function and subject to the constraints of the input uh, of x are of binary minus one, one, okay? And, um, so uh, we said uh, the types of problems we are looking at, and so of course this is very general because many combinatorial problems can be written that way. So for example, mass stuff will have as input an input uh, as input a graph, uh, and the goal is to find a partition into two parts to maximize the weight of cross the cut. You can show that mass stuff can be written as a integer quadratic problem, right? So this is a very general formulation for many combinatorial problems. Now of course many of them are in part, okay? And so, um, uh, like a classic technique to solve such problems, including mass cut from a more theory of computing point of view, 
is to, uh, a classic thing to get good approximation guarantees for such problems, is to do a semi definite programming relaxation. So relax the original problem, or the original integral program to a semi definite program. Uh, and now you associate each variable xi from the original input to, with a vector ui, and now you're maximizing a quadratic form um, uh, as a function of these vectors. And then, of course, we still want to, to, to round the solution to this, uh, uh, to get in the first step to get a legal solution for the original problem. And the classic way to do that is to do this round, randomized rounding procedure due to Gomez and Williamson, or to do which is a random hyperplane. And then we uh, set the variables xi to either minus one or one, depending on which side of the hyperplane the corresponding vector ui that we get from the first step falls in. Okay. And uh, this is again a very classic approach for solving such problems. So for example, for the max cut problem, this, gives, this approach gives a best known approximation guarantee on worst case instances. Now, uh, it's actually known, uh, so this is just one algorithm here, right? Because I, uh, I have the semi-definite programming relaxation plus a specific, uh, followed by a specific rounding procedure. But it's a well known, uh, and it's a work, some of it comes from a work of Feige and Landberg, that if in the second step, Rather than just picking a random hyperplane and doing the rounding based on a random hyperplane, we can also pick a random hyperplane and the margin, and then we only pin down things outside the margin, but inside the margin randomized, it's now that on certain distributions, uh, on certain types of instances, we can get an even better approximation than just using the plane randomized rounding. Okay, so that was known before, uh, just as a structure result. Now, of course, it's immediately implies that you can try to do learning, right? Because you can pin down, you can put down an infinite parameterized assembly of uh, rounding procedures, right? Parameterized by this margin S, right? And we can get an infinite parameterized assembly of algorithms for our, uh, uh, say, max cut problem. And we can try to learn the best algorithm from the family for our type of Okay? And so, again, to answer this question, we have to understand how intrinsically complex is this assembly of algorithms, what's the pseudo dimension of this assembly of algorithms. And I'm not going to go through the details, I just want to mention that it turns out that, again, you can show it's not too large. It's again a log n. And again, the key point is to look at the, these dual functions and to see that they are, again, sufficiently structured. So in particular here, yes? So, so uh, what, what is the class of instances for which the FIG uh, rounding works better? Uh, it's convoluted. I, I don't think it's, any, uh, it's not uh, used to this guy. So it's not, I mean, I cannot, uh, it's not, it's not necessarily natural. Okay. Yeah? So, um, right, so basically, right, we can learn again, like we can show that we can, uh, um, we can show that the pseudo dimension of this and the algorithm is small, is only log n. And again, the key trick is to show that the structure of these dual functions is uh, very nice. So, in particular, we can show that if we uh, fix an instance and we vary the parameter, underlying parameter s, these functions uh, are, uh, are not too wild. In particular, they only have, um, um, they only have like uh, uh, n uh, sh uh, potential sharp transition points. And in between those transition points, they are inversely quadratic, so they are not too crazy. Okay, and this then allows us to again argue that uh, the pseudo dimension is bounded, and to then argue that you can get kind of a meta algorithm for learning the best uh, uh, kind of algorithm of uh, this form for our type of instances. Okay, so this is uh, another example from uh, the context of uh, uh, SDP relaxation trans rounding. Uh, in our work, actually, we also have other examples. Uh, for example, in the context of pricing problems, I'm not going to go through details here, but if you're trying to do, say, pricing of multi-item, multi-buyers, uh, uh, pricing a multi-item, multi-buyer scenarios, right, or you maybe have multiple items for sales and multiple buyers, and you're trying to do pricing, you maybe decide how to price each item, right, uh, then again, you can ask the question, how can I learn the best uh, way to, uh, the best pricing algorithm, let's say, the best item pricing for my type of instances, for my distribution of instances. Okay, and uh, you can again analyze the kind of the pseudo dimension of the corresponding class of pricing procedures you are looking at, and uh, we've done that, and uh, basically in the analysis, we are going to the details, in the analysis, what turns out to be again the key point of the analysis turns out to be that uh, these dual functions are structured. So if I fix 
uh, an instance uh, like uh, the pricing problem. So it means a set of buyers, a set of items, and a set of buyers values for those items. And if I vary the parameters, that means the prices for the each items individually, then kind of the revenue that I get is a function that is a piecewise linear function. So I can have sharp discontinuities, but I don't have too many of them, and moreover, uh, in each piece, I'm linear. Okay, and uh, so this again allows us to get sample complexity guarantees. Okay, so I have a few more minutes. I have want to mention one other line of work. Uh, I want to mention one other important extension of this line of work. Nobody asks this question. By the way, whenever I give this talk, there's one question that everybody asks, and nobody asks it today. So I made the assumption when I talked about like uh, the algorithm selection as a learning problem, I made the assumption that my typical instances come at random from some underlying distribution of our typical instances. Now it's a very questionable assumption. Right, I mean, it's like when, like the instances you are trying to solve, they are not, I mean, the trains of instances are never by ID, right? They are always correlated and so on, so it's a big assumption. It's a big assumption, typically statistical learning theory, but it's even bigger here, I think, just more because instances, are inst whole instances of the underlying algorithmic problem. So it's, it's not always reasonable to assume that there are drawn at random from some fixed unknown distribution of our instances. But it's a good first step to, to understand uh, in, uh, modeling in order to get some formal guarantees at first, and then you can move on to other, more, uh, other learning models. Okay, this is exactly what we've done. It's in our most recent work, so the, f the original line of work here, we're uh, phrasing uh, algorithm selection as a distribution yeah, learning problem. But if you believe that sort of, uh, distribution is uniform, and then sort of, uh, if you believe that sort of somehow uniform performance is a reasonable proxy, but worst case performance. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you can find this is for and there's some, there's some, some, some belief that uh, that might not be too off, right? Yes. And so yeah, that's a reason for. You can find it as four and but yes, that's a reason for. Thank you. So uh, right. Definitely. Okay, but if uh, but yeah. Um, but if you don't believe that, or, or more about if uh, for whatever reason, the data is presented to you not in a, a batch scenario, but in an online fashion, you still want to get kind of guarantees for this algorithm selection uh, in an online scenario. Okay, and this is what we've done in our most recent uh, work. So, uh, not uh, like to, uh, what I talked about so far, I'm assuming that the instances are given to me up front, and moreover, they are ID uh, from some unknown distribution of typical instances. Uh, uh, but, you know, what if the instances come online one by one? What if the ID assumption is not satisfied, and moreover, what if the instances come one by one? Then what we can hope to do is to try to achieve no regret. We can hope to do is so to can try to compete with the best algorithm in hindsight. Okay, and uh, uh, the challenge here is, so you can try to apply the framework of online learning to address this question. The challenge is, is that with, as we have seen in our, in this algorithm selection problem, because the classes of functions we are learning over are much more complicated, the corresponding cost functions are not structured, they are non-convex, they can have lots of sharp discontinuities, and so we cannot really apply the framework, the known frameworks of online learning, because typically in online learning we assume that the, the cost functions are either linear or convex, none of that happens here. So we have to basically develop new techniques for providing online guarantees uh, for algorithm selection. And in particular, the high level that we have to identify is general properties uh, of uh, these cost functions that are sufficient for getting no regret guarantees. And uh, to then show that this holds for uh, many algorithm selection problems. Okay, and uh, just gonna spend a couple more slides and I'm gonna end, I just want to uh, just define what the online learning framework here is. So we are going in round, uh, in each round we, uh, 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 the, the online algorithm chooses a parameter rho t in the algorithm selection problem, that means in each round we decide what algorithm we're going to use next for the next algorithm problem. Okay, and then the adversary selects a piecewise Lipschitz function, will be in this case. Uh, we'll assume that the, the, uh, the algorithm selects a piecewise Lipschitz function in the algorithm selection problem that corresponds to the adversary selects a problem instance, which then induces a scoring function. And as you already seen, the scoring functions are often piecewise Lipschitz, turns out. Okay, and then the, uh, the, the, uh, we get a payoff, in particular we get a score of the parameter that we selected, so we get some utility for the parameter that we selected. And then uh, we also observe feedback, in the full information feedback we observe the whole, uh, the whole utility function or the whole uh, scoring function, or at least we can evaluate the points of our own choice. 
And when in the, uh, we see the full information or in the bandit feedback, we uh, actually only observe the payoff of the parameter that we play or the payoff of the, the hours that we used for solving the instance. Okay, and when the goal is to then minimize regret, so that means we want to come up with a meta-learning procedure here, uh, so that we minimize regret, which means the, perform the gap between the performance of the best parameter in hindsight and the, our cumulative performance. That's the goal. Okay, and it's known that the known techniques tell, uh, for, uh, for uh, simple cases, like when the, the cost functions are convex or linear or you have a finite number of uh, possible options, we can achieve regret, uh, but uh, uh, in a way, we can achieve no regret by using uh, uh, various schemes like exponential weights. Uh, we, uh, and the regret that the typical regret that we achieve is of the form per hour regret approaches zero at the rate of one over square root of t. Okay, but this is for known, uh, for simple cases when we have linear or convex cost functions. In our case, we can have sharp discontinuity, so uh, very far from uh, being so nice. And because of that, because of the sharp discontinuities, it's actually uh, impossible to get no regret in worst case instances. So if all I promise you is that the cost functions are piecewise leaf sheets, you no, cannot get no regret. And in particular, even for uh, threshold functions, which are just the simplest uh, kind of functions that have a discontinuity in one dimension, uh, you cannot achieve no regret because the other can give you a sequence of cost functions of an expectation each round you achieve uh, 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 reg uh, regret the half, for example. You achieve, uh, you, you pay, yeah, it's not good. Okay, so it turns out that to actually get no regret guarantees, we need an additional structural condition. And I'm not going to go through the details, I want to show you just a picture. This structural condition allows us to get no regret guarantees for this more general piecewise which is function, something that we call dispersion, which is by the way very intuitive to describe. So we are now looking about cost functions that can have discontinuities, like these functions here. To get no regret, it turns out that we need to ensure that um, if we look at our sequence of cost functions, uh, the discontinuities are dispersed in the sense that in any interval, uh, or in general in any L2 ball of radius W, I do not have too many discontinuities. Okay, and of course, event can put parameters and formalizes. Okay, but that's the key picture. To get no regret, you need to make sure that uh, uh, basically in any, if we look in hindsight, in any small ball, uh, at not too many dysfunctions, cost functions and discontinuities. Okay, and this then allows us to achieve no regret, and uh, you know, and often we achieve no regret, the, uh, the, uh, the typical regret, like square root of t, cumulative regret, or one per square root of t, an average regret. Okay, and I'm gonna skip all that, and uh, I'm happy to talk about any of these details of lines, because I cover several papers in this uh, talk, but if you're curious, please come and talk to me, I'm more than happy to tell you details about all of them. Uh, and so, because I'm running out, out of time, I just want to uh, summarize, Okay, so uh, what I talked about today is a new line of work of uh, data and algorithm design. As I mentioned in the beginning, this has been widely used in practice. In our work, uh, we are providing uh, strong formal guarantees for the first time for this approach, which I think is very important for practical problems when, when we are trying to solve combinatorial problems. Um, and we provide, in order to provide these formal guarantees, we provide and exploit uh, structural properties of the dual class of functions. Uh, so this is the kind of the key technique, the key theme that comes throughout all these works. Uh, and this is, allows us to get good sample complexity in a distribution learning formalization and good regret bounds in an online learning formalization. I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but turns out that the techniques that we developed for doing online learning also allow us, allow us to get differential privacy guarantees. If for whatever reason you're not trying to select an algorithm, but why the differential type, don't have information about any specific instance that brings that. So the same dispersion condition allows us to, to get those guarantees, and um, so that's nice. And also, to go back to Andreas first question, you know, like, is this augmented learning machine learning in any way? And the answer is yes, definitely it's augmented learning theory. I think that from a learning theory uh, point of view, the techniques are of interest because, uh, you know, the kind of the functions, the functions, the type of functions that we analyze are much less structured. And our bounds, uh, you know, depend on the dual class of functions, which is kind of a new, a novel uh, kind of way to analyze the pseudo dimension, or uh, actually to even like on in the, the example, yeah, the pseudo dimension for distribution and normalization. And also, our results for online learning are much more general than what we did in online learning before. Okay, and uh, to summarize, also just mention uh, like before. Uh, actually, I want to also mention a couple of. 
uh, future directions uh, is actually maybe just mentioned briefly, but um, in addition to the family of violence that we, uh, I presented in the talk, in our work we also looked at other family of violence like the branch bound techniques, learning how to branch for solving mixed integer programs. We had an ICML paper that showed what's nice there. Not only we had strong formal guarantees, but it turns out that uh, we did better, like we were able to learn how to branch in a way that leads to better performance than CPLEX, for example, which is the, the, the state of the art commercial solver. Okay, and similarly, some, some other works, like I didn't show any experimental results, but in some of these works, we also have experimental results, like for example, learning to branch in our new lips paper on uh, parameter voice method and so on. And I also want to kind of uh, mention, uh, maybe end by mentioning an interesting uh, uh, open question here. So, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, this line of work is very related in spirit to hyperparameter tuning or uh, meta learning or auto ML, which are like very popular topics in machine learning these days. The main difference is that really we are looking at more combinatorial problems, so you have much harder structure and you also have formal guarantees. Yeah, but it'd be very interesting to kind of use our uh, kind of insights to uh, uh, analyze some of these more classic machine learning problems. And in particular, I think one uh, like one direction has a lot of potential. Uh, uh, one one but, right, potentially very uh, fruitful direction here is to try to use these techniques to kind of think about hyperparameter tuning in deep nets. So even in deep nets, if we start to learn the structure of a deep net, like you know when we start. To but how many layers, how many nodes per layer, when we're going to get, again, going to get this picture of sharp discontinuities. And so, uh, like, class motion and horizontal lines, it would be very interesting if so somehow our techniques can lead to principal ways to do hyperparameter Okay? And I'm happy to take any questions. The idea of counting number of discontinuities that works when you have a single parameter. It works works in high dimension. So I uh, like the pricing problems that we've done is not about counting, but like the formal definition would be not count the number of discontinuities, but the formal definition we're gonna think about like uh, uh, how many of these how many of these functions, like what's the fraction, like if you're looking at so like uh, if you have a sequence of functions here, they are not in one dimension, can, can, can be in high dimension. If you, the question you're asking in any ball, in that uh, b dimensional space, in any other ball, how many of them have any discontinuities? Or like, uh, right. So it won't work in those scenarios. And actually, in fact, our Fox paper, right, this, uh, this online learning of piece, like this functions actually in that work, you phrase the problem in b dimensions, and the results are very for uh, b dimensional problems as well. And the, the bounds will depend on. Uh, uh, of course, the dimension. So there will be like sort of t times d times some other parameters in the problem. So it's not a specific one dimension. For my talk, I only one dimension because they're easier to describe. But definitely, some of the results are in high dimensions. Thank you. Thanks, Professor.